concept behind this whole webinar series is essentially we wanted to bring something to you, a kind of a collaboration between Chelsea and I, where, uh, you know, the horticulture aspect and the foods and nutrition aspects can work together. So we're going to talk about everything that's happening in your garden right now, and then everything that's coming out of your garden right now, and what you can do with that produce. Um, let's go ahead and get into my portion of this. Hopefully my screen will work with me. Here we go. Um, we are going to talk about fall veggie gardening because right now is the time to be planting your fall veggie gardens. Actually, you're on the very tail end of it. Um, and we'll talk about that more. But if you have any questions for me, um, you can find my contact information on our website or you can uh, contact the Master Gardener hotline. Our number is right there. It is 913-715-7050. So all of this information that I will be talking about shortly comes from the brand new Kansas Garden Guide. Uh, this was just revamped this year by Rebecca McMahon. She did a fantastic job on it. Um, you will find everything you need to know about gardens in this thing. You can find the free version online at that link right there. Or if you'd like to stop by your local extension office or the uh, Johnson County Extension Office, it is available for $40. So why do we fall garden? Um, obviously, the main reason that I think would come to a lot of people's mind is because you're trying to grow a garden, right? You want more produce for a longer amount of time. But I don't think people realize just how many benefits can actually come from fall gardening. Uh, technically, if you are fall gardening, you can go all the way to Thanksgiving. And a lot of your Thanksgiving meal can actually come from your yard if you're doing it properly and if the weather is cooperating with you. Um, also, if you even if it's not cooperating with you, uh, you can preserve your fall garden harvest, right? And use that for the holidays as well. And Chelsea will be talking about that. Um, we will. One of the other benefits is also that it helps your soil. Um, you know, one of the things with plants being in in the soil is that they um, are going to uh, help it. When it comes to preventing erosion, it's going to keep your soil in place. It's going to help all of that beneficial fungi. Um, you know, gardens don't like to sit fallow. So uh, having those plants in there for longer is actually going to help your garden stay healthier longer. And it keeps you in the garden. All those health benefits that you get from being out in the garden, getting the vitamin D and getting that, uh, you know, low intensity exercise is um, going to continue throughout the, the fall season. And one of the unique benefits to fall gardening specifically is that um, a lot of your vegetables will actually develop a better flavor when grown in the fall. So all these fall vegetables, one of the uh, unique aspects to them is that they uh, take a long time to develop as the season begins to cool, right? So they are technically plants that like to grow in cold weather, but because of that, they grow slower. And when the weather starts to get colder, um, they are going to take a take time to develop those those chemicals that are essentially inside them, right? A lot of times that will equate to sweeter produce uh, because the sugars within the plants are are developing better. So I think when a lot of people think of the fall environment and what you're growing vegetables in, uh, they're thinking to the fact that it's going to be coming <laughs> that's going to be cold, right? Uh, it's becoming cold. But uh, the other aspect that a lot of people need to remember is that the vegetables are starting in the hottest portion of the year. So all of your vegetables are going in right now, literally the hottest portion of the year. I don't know if anyone's been outside, <laughs> but um, it's it's a finicky um, environment to, to try to work with because you have to battle all of the um, the aspects of that late summer heat plus you are trying to address the extreme cold that is going to come at the end of the season. <laughs> so if we look here, this is a general look at the Aletha area here in Johnson County of what is happening with the air temperature throughout the fall um, with, with our environments. Um, as you can see, we're going all the way from upper 90s down to almost uh, mid 30s, lower 30s. Um, so it's kind of all over the place in fall, but as we gradually change from September through um, November, it, it's going to drop about 10 degrees uh, every month. 
And that's illustrated a lot better actually here in our soil temperature, which is almost more important than the air temperature in some aspects, because that is where all of our, uh, you know, seedlings are going to be growing. That's where um, our cool season crops are going to enjoy being growing. And because they are cool season crops, they enjoy growing in cold weather. So when we're trying to seed them right now so that they're to size um, all the way in November, uh, we have to address the fact that the soil is 90 degrees and it's not 40 degrees. So you can see these two graphs here. This is from the Kansas Garden Guide as well. I've highlighted the um, cool season crops, essentially, both on the left and right side. The left side would be the planting times and the right side would be the harvesting times. There are a lot of crops that are cool season crops, as you can see. That's where the majority of the color on these graphs are. Um, that said, if you look at these graphs, especially the planting times, a lot of them fell into July or early August. So really within the next two weeks is when you're going to need to be getting your produce into the ground. Just keep in mind, um, you're going to want to probably wait until this heat wave has passed. Um, with the temperatures as extreme as they are right now, it's not going to be very hospitable to newly emerging seedlings. Excuse me, one second. So the phrase of the day is cold hardiness. Um, and that is because as much as we need to address the heat that is coming from uh, you know, the late summer, we need to remember the fact that this is going to be going all the way into winter. And the best vegetables for fall are the ones that can handle the light frost, that can handle a full freeze. So this graph also from the Kansas Garden Guide uh, gives you a better um, idea of what that is. The beans and cucumbers and squash are technically summer crops, but they can carry all the way through fall, uh, provided the, the weather cooperates and you do a little bit of uh, babying to keep them through the, the winter. So, or not the winter, but the fall. Um, and that includes covering the crops, um, essentially protecting them from freezes. And then you have your semi-hardy crops here. That is going to include a lot of your uh, collards, your cabbage, um, brassicas essentially. Uh, because they have those those chemicals, those anthocyanins in there that um, like to uh, not freeze. Um, and then you have your extremely hardy crops, which would be your cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, the main thing to remember with those is that they should probably be in the ground already because they have a long uh, produce or growing time. And then as I mentioned, we have warm season carryover. So a lot of these crops like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, eggplants, and sweet potatoes, those are summer crops, right? They are not cold hardy whatsoever, but they will technically keep producing throughout the fall until we get that really first hard freeze. So let's talk about garden amendments. We talked about what can go into the garden right now and why, um, but there are ways that you have to address this to be successful, right? So the first thing you wanna keep in mind is early developing varieties. So dependent on the variety of plants that you're putting into the ground, uh, you want to keep in mind that um, some varieties take a long time to develop and some varieties take a very short time to develop. To, to develop. Uh, the fact that <laughs> The thing that you need to remember is that uh, fall can be very short, right? So what you need to do is uh, find the varieties that uh, are very early developing and try not to incorporate the ones that have a long development. Um, that can usually, usually be found on your seed packets. And then remember that pest pressure is going to be a completely different game uh, in the fall as opposed to the spring. Uh, in the spring, all the pests have essentially died. They're uh, dormant. They haven't <laughs> you know, thrived throughout the season yet. Uh, but in the fall, they have had the entire growing season to grow, right? So they're going to be already there and present in your garden, and you're going to have to proactively tackle these so that they're not um, attacking your newly your newly planted uh, fall crop. And there's lots of ways you can go about this. One second, let me change my view here so that I can see my bullets. Um, you want to fully dispose infected plant residue when rotating crops. Uh, this is because plant residue can easily hold on to any of your pests, any of your diseases. Um, so uh, when you are rotating your crops out from, from summer crops, be sure to get any of the leaves or anything that's fallen onto the ground out of there. Uh, plant varieties that are immune to uh, disease problems um, and you can also just 
support the healthiest plants possible. So that is going to be um, coming back to your spacing, your fertilizing, your watering, your weeding, and pruning. That's just general plant care, right? But uh, sustaining the healthiest, healthiest plants possible is going to help when it comes to fighting off all those diseases and pests. Um, and then for severe infestations, I know a lot of people don't like to use pesticides in their gardens, but um, if you are willing to do so, um, you may need to do that if you have a severe infestation. In those cases, you just want to be sure you're following label instructions and be sure that you are um, ad adhering to the, the desiccation time after um, applying. You don't want to be uh, consuming those crops until the proper amount of time has passed. And so there are a few growing modifications that you can do when it comes to planting things right now. Um, being that it is so hot outside, uh, you are going to run into some, to some issues with your soil. Um, primarily, if you're watering right now, it's going to crust over very easily. So what you can actually do is apply a light layer of organic mulch or, say, a compost over the top of it. And that's just going to help with keeping your soil a little bit cooler and it's a lot more moist, right? Um, also, planting your seeds, um, you're going to want to plant slightly deeper than uh, what is recommended. And that's, again, going to help keep it a little bit colder, a little bit wetter than what it um, would need to be in the spring. Um, one of the things that is recommended for fall gardening um, that is not recommended when you're trying to do a fall crop is uh, incorporating compost into your garden soil. Um, that is because if you do this right now, it can easily dry out. It might be a little bit hydrophobic and it's not gonna be the most hospitable environment for your fall crops. So you actually wanna wait until after your fall crops come out to incorporate that compost into the garden. Some additional considerations. These crops are going to use a lot of the nutrients that are on the ground. And being that we are at the, the end of the growing season, um, you need to remember that these the, the uh, nutrients are going to be a bit depleted. So um, adding a fertilizer that's just a low range, uh, like a 13-13-13, which stands for the three main nutrients, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, um, that is just going to give them the food they need to get through the season. Uh, brassicas will also require some additional nitrogen because they are very hardy plants. So they need that nitrogen to help them grow. And then season extension is something you can keep in mind um, as you grow your fall crops, because you can, with the correct modifications, like these low tunnels here in this photo, um, actually keep your crops growing all the way into winter uh, until the inside of that tunnel hits 28 degrees, and then, then those crops are going to die. So what can actually be planted right now? This is our uh, planting calendar again from the Kansas Garden Guide. Lots of stuff can go into the ground, but again, we're looking at our lettuces, our leafy greens, um, a lot of our hardier root crops, and then again, our, our um, brassicas. Marginally, our broccoli, our cabbage, our cauliflower can grow, but again, they are typically planted in July because they have such a long development time. And then also all of these crops right here are coming out of the garden right now. So beans, collards, cucumbers, eggplant, kale, melons, okra, peppers, squash, corn, tomato, watermelon, all of these are coming out right now and they can also actually be preserved right now in one form or another. So that is where I'm going to hand this over to Chelsea to talk about um, preserving. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, As for those that joined late, uh, my name is Chelsea Reinberg and I am the Nutrition, Food Safety and Health Agent. Um, I'm the dietitian and we do a lot of our fall cooking classes as well coming up, um, but we're just going to talk a little bit about a few things. So next slide. So to start, you know, why do we want to consume and preserve our own food? Um, if you love gardening, obviously you love growing your food and you love the taste of it. So the benefit of preserving it is you get to have that homegrown food all year round. Um, a lot of people that make their own produce at home also do it to save money at the grocery store. As we've seen in the past couple of years specifically, food prices have skyrocketed. And so uh, a seed is fairly inexpensive when you think about the actual cost of, say, apples or carrots or tomatoes at the grocery store. The benefit is you can also preserve food at its peakness. Um, the benefit of this is not only the flavor, but also the nutrition component. Uh, food that is harvested, consumed, or preserved at the peak tends to be richer in vitamins and minerals. Um, again, the great homemade taste. 
less preservatives and additives in our food. A lot of people are becoming conscious of the not only amount of sodium or sugar added, but also other preservatives, um, artificial colors, artificial ingredients that are added to food that is bought on the store, even something as simple as fruits and vegetables um, that isn't necessary, but is, is something that is happening in our food, in our food system. Um, knowing where your food came from, obviously that's a great benefit, knowing that you grew it yourself and that it came right out of your garden. And then also if you make your own food and grow your own food, you're also more likely to cook that food at home and to not eat out quite as often. So again, that goes back to cost saving, but also the nutrition impact. Next slide. So some factors to consider when planning what method you're going to use to preserve your food at home. Um, there's a couple different things. So you have your time that you have available. Uh, canning food obviously takes a little bit longer than say just popping it in the freezer. Your equipment and your space, maybe you have a, a small kitchen and you really don't have a lot of space for canning. So then maybe you rely on freezing. The weather, um, I don't know about you, but I had some tomatoes that I needed to preserve and, or they would go bad. And I certainly was not going to can them and heat up my kitchen right now in this 100 degree weather. So I just popped them in the freezer to use at a later time. Um, how the food will be used. So some food doesn't freeze quite as well. Um, so maybe canning is the best option. So determining what you're going to use it for. And then just a personal interest and preference. A lot of people say, I don't like canning, so I'm just going to throw it in the free freezer. A lot of people love the process of canning. Um, and so they choose that route. A couple other things to consider is, um, you know, the nutrient value. So all of them, as you can see in that picture on the right, and we're going to kind of go into this in a little bit more detail, but for the most part, if you preserve food at its peak, um, it will retain most of its vitamins and minerals. There's a few losses depending upon which method you use. Um, and I'm not going to talk about freeze drying, but freeze drying has become a very, very popular uh, form of food preservation. Um, it has a very high initial cost um, with the equipment, but it is an option. Next slide. So what's more nutritious? I get this question all the time, um, whether you're making your own food or buying it from the grocery store, is fresh really best? Can I buy canned? Can I buy frozen? Is there a difference? And so fresh, if consumed at its peak, is going to have a very rich nutrient quality. However, if we buy strawberries fresh from the grocery store in December, we can guarantee that those were not grown here in Kansas, um, but that they came from somewhere else. And so the longer they sit and the longer they're exposed to oxygen and things like that, there is going to be a loss of vitamins and minerals over time. Canned, if you pick it at its ripeness and um, can it right then and there, again, you will have a lot of those nutrients are retained. The one thing with canning is that you do use a high temperature. And so that high processing heat can have an impact on certain water soluble vitamins like B and C. However, on the flip side, it may increase some antioxidants. So when we're talking about tomatoes, specifically the lycopene in tomatoes, which has been shown as an antioxidant has reduced the risk of cancer, um, processing them versus in a canner versus frozen will actually increase those antioxidants of that lycopene. So it makes um, it more impactful. Um, and then canning can be packed in syrup, salt, or just in plain water. So that is something to consider. Um, and salt and sugar typically have a reason in canning. Um, there are some vegetables and fruits that you can use with limited or no added ingredients of that salt or sugar but you definitely have to make sure that the recipe is one that qualifies and accommodates that. Frozen, again, it, it is peaked and kind of flash frozen at the peak of ripeness. So it does retain those minerals and vitamins. However, blanching it before you freeze it, which is a requirement in many of the um, vegetables specifically, but some fruits as well, you may have some loss of vitamins and minerals in that blanching process. But again, it's, it's very nominal. Um, and then dehydrated, that heat causes a loss of your vitamin A and vitamin C. Sometimes sulfites um, are added to dehydrated foods. This is more common in the large manufacturing process and not so common in your household dehydrating. Um, but those sulfites may reduce the mineral, the vitamin thiamine. And so that is something to consider, especially if you already have a low thiamine intake. 
blanching before drying, again, may lose some of those vitamins and minerals, but it is very minimal in terms of the loss versus the benefits of all the fruits and vegetables. Next slide. So the necessary equipment for canning, um, I'm not going to go too much into canning besides just kind of the basics equipment. This is our very first presentation, so I want to lay out kind of all the equipment and then in future ones, um, I've, I'll probably just refer back to this first webinar where you can kind of get the information. So the necessary equipment for canning, you have two options. You have your pressure canner and your water bath canner. And we're gonna go into what is required for what vegetables or fruits here um, in a bit. But the pressure canner um, is one that people are most terrified of and they're afraid they're gonna blow up their kitchen. Um, but a lot of the pressure canners these days have all of the safety features um, they have the vent port, they have um, an extra release button. And so a lot of them are quite safer than what they used to be. You will either have the dial or the weighted gauge. And so um, again, that's just a personal preference. They all serve the same purpose and how they ultimately cook the food and process the, the canning equipment, but it is just a personal preference. And then you have your water bath. And so the difference between the, the canner on the left and the canner on the right as you can see, is also the water level. So your pressure canner, you are going to only use a minimal amount of water, maybe two inches at the bottom. And on the flip side, the water bath, you're actually going to fill it all up and you're needing to have one to two inches of water covering your jars. And so that's something that sometimes people tend to forget or if they're new to canning, don't remember. And so that is really critical because if you put too much water in your pressure canner, it doesn't allow that pressure to build up and then it will not pro process the food correctly and you have an increased risk for a uh, botulism or other form of foodborne illness. If you do want to water bath and pressure can, note that your pressure canner can be used as a water bath canner you just want to apply the weight or the, the stop that keeps the pressure in. So you would take that piece off to allow the pressure to not build up. And you can use that same, um, the same method for your water bath. Next slide. So one quick note, uh, we do do pressure gauge testing. Uh, we do the dial pressure gauges. Those do need to be checked yearly just to make sure that they're reading accurately. If there's more than two pounds off, you do need to replace them or get them um, serviced. So a weighted gauge canner does not need to be tested. It's, it's the standard set five, 10, and 15 pounds. We're on this dial gauge. As you can see, um, you have the individual numbers and it does variations. A one pound error in a 20 minute processing can cause an increase um, in desterilization value. And, and then the two pound error can cause a 30% decrease. So as you can see, even if it's one to two pounds off, which may not seem like a lot to us, it can have a significant impact on your end result. And so uh, we do do testing free of charge to you. All you do need, all you need to do is bring in your um, lid specifically, and we can test that for you. Next slide. So what method do you need to use? This is a common question, right? What vegetables or fruits need to be water bath or pressure canned? So your high acid fruits, foods, which are typically your fruits um, and tomatoes fall into that high acid category as well. Um, those are the ones that can be water bath. And this is because the high acid, um, the acidity prevents foodborne illness and bacteria from growing. Where on the flip side, your low acid foods, which are typically your meats, and your vegetables are going to need that longer processing time and that higher heat in order to make them safe and to kill all potential foodborne illness, including botulism. So um, you can see the difference right there. A water bath is only at 212 at boiling where the pressure canner gets up to 240 degrees. Um, so there is a little bit of a difference in temperature, and then um, as you'll see, as you are canning, you have different times as well that go with it. Next slide. So one important thing is always, always remember to use bottled lemon juice. And so a lot of recipes will require you to add an acid. Again, that acid prevents bacteria from growing and keeps your food safer. The difference is that the lemons that you buy from the store are, are having, having a little 
jumping around here. Sorry about that. Um, so the lemons that you buy from the store, you really don't know what their acidity level is. You cannot confirm that. And so bottled lemon juice has the same acidity, no matter what type of bottle you buy. And the one thing to remember with that is just to make sure that you are using a fresh one. If you have a bottle that's been in your refrigerator for a couple of years and you're not sure how old or it is expired, um, it can lose acidity over time. So you want to make sure that you are using a fresh new bottle. Next slide. So just because grandma did it doesn't mean it's safe. So one thing that we get a lot is, with canning specifically is I have this great salsa recipe. Can I can it? And, and really the answer is no. Um, just because grandma canned her beans in using a water bath canner, her green beans and using a water bath canner doesn't mean it's safe, right? As you saw in the previous slides, um, green beans do need to be pressure canned to be considered safe. There's a lot of reasons why we don't want to use grandma's recipes or previous recipes from, from years past. This is because we do have new technology. As I mentioned, we have different equipment now. There's different varieties, um, different varieties of plants. And so tomatoes are one of the interesting ones because the newer variety of tomatoes, uh, we tend to like to eat tomatoes by themselves, right? And so we don't like very acidic ones. And so some of the newer varieties, um, and I don't have it in this presentation, but in other presentations, there's large variability between the acidity levels. And so just because we think that tomatoes are acidic, they actually could be on that range and they could be closer to that 4.8 or 4.9, which 4.6 is that middle line. And so they would technically be over that safe acid level of what we would consider to be water bath versus pressure canning. Better testing and of course lessons learned, the lessons learned of people getting sick in the past and knowing that this is the way that we need to do things differently. And then it's important to use current food preservation practices and the recipes. So don't just go to any blog post online and find um, a way to preserve whatever's in your garden. You really do wanna use those reliable tested resources. And so some of them are like your ball blue book, the USDA has a canning guide, um, so easy to preserve is another publication. And so most resources from extension agencies, whether it's K-State or whether it's a different extension university, are going to have those reliable tested ones. So I would encourage you to make sure that you are following those. And there is a lot of rebel canning out there, especially on social media. So don't fall trapped to those. Um, just because you see something on Instagram or Twitter, how somebody can something, make sure you do your research before you follow whatever they are doing. Next slide. So creative canning equals foodborne illness. Um, this picture on the right is a picture of canned peppers with botulism. So they look pretty gross, but um, improper home vegetables specifically are the most common cause of botulism outbreaks in the U.S., it's either because they did not pressure can, they water bath instead of pressure can, they ignored the spoilage signs. I mean, if you look at that can of peppers on the right, they look like you shouldn't eat them. Um, but some people tend to ignore those spoilage signs. Um, improper instructions, so they don't process for the correct time. They don't process at the correct pressure. And also just unaware of the risks. And so um, we also sometimes get a lot of questions about improperly sealed jars, whether you're water bath or pressure canning. And 99% of improperly sealed jars are usually due to user error. Um, something as small as a cotton from a towel that is stuck under the lid could present, prevent that lid from sealing correctly. Um, I have been getting a lot of calls lately of lids not sealing. Um, I'm not sure if it's the, the climate, the temperature, if it's just kind of bad, faulty batches that are being processed from the manufacturers, um, but sometimes that does happen. And you can um, put it in the refrigerator within 24 hours if your can does not seal correctly or reprocess. Next slide. You wanna remember to adjust for your altitude. Um, so here we are around kind of that 1000 feet, a little bit over, but if you were to go out to Western Kansas and you were preserving out there, you would have to make sure you knew your elevation because it is a little bit higher as you get closer to the, the Colorado mountains and just the different um, terrains. 
So always make sure that you're checking your elevation. Um, once you know, and if you're only doing canning at your house, great, then you know where you're at. But if you tend to have a couple different houses that you go back and forth, or if you have family that you tend to visit and do some canning with, you want to make sure that you know the elevation. And most, if not all recipes, they should have how to adjust for the ele elevation for that recipe. Next slide. So the nutrition of some of those warm season carryover crops. I want to just say that all fruits and vegetables are great, right? They're full of nutrition, full of high fiber, low in calorie antioxidants. And I'm not going to say that any is better than the other. We really want to make sure that we eat the rainbow and you cannot get all of nu the nutrition from eating one source of a fruit or a vegetable. And those quote superfoods, um, they are great. Like blueberries are an example and they're known as a superfood. They do have a lot of nutrition, but you're going to get different nutrition from a blueberry versus a tomato. And we're gonna kind of talk about some of those key differences. I'm not going to go into all the details about the nutrition of each of those. I'm just going to highlight a couple key things from each of them. So as I mentioned, tomatoes, they are high in the antioxidant lycopene. Um, so lycopene is good for cancer prevention. Um, it has been linked to a reduction in prostate cancer, specifically in men, obviously for those that consume a lot of more tomatoes, um, have that in, in reduced risk. Um, they also has been known to support eye health. And so um, lycopene the antioxidant has a lot of great anti-cancer properties and just overall good health. Cucumbers, a lot of people say like cucumbers and your lettuce. Well, there's no nutrition in them, right? They're just plain old crops with nothing good to add, right? They don't have any color. They don't really have any flavor, um, but that's a false statement because they do have a lot of vitamins and minerals. Um, the thing with cucumbers as well is they support good hydration. They are about 96% water. So especially on these hot days, um, by consuming cucumbers, plain and a salad, however you want to eat them, it does help to support hydration because anything that we get from the foods that we eat in terms of fluids also helps to keep us hydrated. It's not just about drinking um, water or other beverages, but it's also about the food that we put into our body to help hydrate us during these hot days. Peppers, this is a fact that some people are quite surprised about, but um, we always hear about vitamin C in oranges, right? When we're sick, have some orange juice, right? Get some of that vitamin C. But peppers actually contain more vitamin C than oranges. Um, and so this is something that is, peppers are, are a vegetable, right? What, how we consider it. So um, we want to make sure that we are getting a wide variety and that peppers do have a good source of vitamin C. Red peppers will slightly have a little bit more nutrients than your green peppers. And again, this is just because they've been on the plant stem a little bit longer. And so they've been able to build up some of those vitamins and minerals a little bit longer than your green bell peppers. Eggplant, um, there are a few of those purple and blue plants. And so those have anthocyanins, again, an antioxidant that is great for cancer prevention. Your sweet potatoes and your other orange crops are your vitamin A, which is really good for your eyesight. Um, sweet potatoes actually have a lot of fiber in them as well. So they are a really great source. And then last is your leafy greens. All of these in this leafy green category are going to have slightly different nutritional profiles. However, all of them are going to have folate, which is a really important nutrient, especially for young women and women who are trying to become pregnant. Folate is really important for a neurotube development in babies. And so having a diet high in folate is really important. Antioxidants, uh, leafy greens are full of antioxidants, um, carotenoids, which is that vitamin A, which we wouldn't think of being high in those leafy greens because they're not a green color or they're not, uh, excuse me, a yellow color, they're green, but they do have um, antioxidants of the carotenoid family. And then minerals like calcium. Um, so one of the things is that spinach has a lot of calcium. However, sometimes that calcium isn't quite as well absorbed as drinking a glass of milk. And cup for cup, so one cup of milk, you would have to have about six to eight cups of spinach. Um, so I don't know about you, but I'm not eating eight cups of spinach to get the calcium equivalent of one milk because it is quite a bit, but it is a good source of, of calcium to note. Next slide. So what to do with what is being harvested now? 
Um, here's just a few ideas. I don't have too many recipes, but to maybe get you thinking about different ways to use it. So salsa, of course, is, is the common one with tomatoes. Um, the thing to consider with tomatoes specifically, if you are freezing it, is you want to make sure that you are using a more, a more pureed salsa and not a chunky one, because we'll talk in the next um, slide about the impact of freezing and what that does. One thing that goes really well together is fruit and tomatoes. So thinking to do like a peach and tomato caprese salad instead of, of your typical tomato and mozzarella and that's all, add some fruit into that. Um, making a tomato bacon jam, again, this cannot be canned, but it is really delicious to have on meats and other things. Of course, your, your peppers, um, they're pretty universal. One thing that I love to do is to make like a, a dip using peppers. So you would just roast them and can you pur puree them to add a nice, beautiful color, especially if you use the red, the red peppers. And then corn, um, corn is one of those that typically is ate on the cob, but it can be made into a relish. Um, I love to grill it or uh, roast it and mix it with a variety of vegetables, especially as you start to mix in your zucchinis and your tomatoes. It really creates a nice, tasty, tasty dish. Next slide. So when we had our uh, food preservation class here in July, we did our a corn relish. And so this is a water bath recipe because we have a large quantity of vinegar. So we have that acid level. Um, if you don't have that acid, then that is when you would have to pressure can because again, this is a vegetable, so it is a low acid food. Um, but feel free to take a picture of this or um, request, we can send you the recipe if you would like that. But this is a really fun, easy dish. It makes for a great gift as well. And just a nice thing to have um, to be able to take to barbecues or other things like that. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, tomatoes need acid. They do have a, a wide range of acidity. And so this is true for all colors of tomatoes. Um, when you are using your tomatoes to make salsa, um, tomato sauce, anything like that, you do have to add acid to can them safely. And so the standard is for one pint, you add one tablespoon of a bottled lemon juice or for quarts, you can add two tablespoons of that bottled lemon juice. Additionally, citric acid can be used to add acid to, um, to your produce. And the, you can buy this. Um, this is an example of Mrs. Wages here. You can buy that in the store as well. It is a little bit pricier than your typical lemon juice. So you have to just decide on which one you would be using and your preference. Next slide. So salsa tips, a couple things with that. Um, don't experiment. Again, don't can your own recipe because you don't know the acidity level of all of your fruits and vegetables that you may be mixing in. Um, your peppers, your onions, all of those are low acid. And so you don't know the quantities, the ratios that may make it unsafe or how to make it safe. A paste type tomato obviously um, is for the best quality. That's just because it has a little bit more of that liquid. Regulate the heat. You can add different peppers to make it spicier or less spicier. And you really want to let that salsa sit for about a month after you canned it to really have that optimal flavor. That's how it um, that's how it develops. And then if you do add fruit into it, you want to make sure that you prevent the fruit by from browning. And so you want to use an acid in advance. So you could either dip them in lemon juice or that citric acid, or they have other fruit fresh preserves that can be put on. Um, and then again, do not change the recipe. Do not decrease or increase ingredients. Um, you want to make sure that you're using whatever recipe. And this is specifically for canning. If you're going to freeze, if you're going to serve it fresh, you know, you can experiment and do whatever you want. But for canning specifically, you do need to make sure you are following a specific recipe that is approved. Next. Tips on freezing to tomatoes. So tomatoes, freezing them does damage the, those fruit cell walls. And so by when this happens, it releases the extra water that's stored in tomatoes. Don't want to water bath your salsa. You can freeze it. But again, that cooked salsa works best because the cooking process also takes some of that extra water out. Otherwise, it will be too liquidy when you are draining it. Um, and then you have your freeze, you can freeze them whole or stewed. 
Um, I personally like this one. That's what I just did recently when I didn't want to get to them because when I defrost them, the peels come off really nice and all that extra liquid comes out. And then it really does make for a nice thick either salsa or a nice thick sauce. And then use freezer safe containers. Don't use your leftover, um, your, your leftover like Miracle Whip containers or anything like that. You really wanna make sure you're using freezer safe containers because it helps to keep all the extra freezer burn off. Next slide. Preserving leafy greens. This is something that people tend to forget about that you can do. And I, sometimes it's just people don't like the taste or the, the change of the texture. Um, your tender leafy greens, like your leaf lettuce, doesn't preserve well. So you're going to have to consume all of that uh, fresh because those are going to not hold up quite well. So have a salad a day when you're having your ripeness in your garden and then freeze or preserve the, the rest. They can be, so your hardier leafy greens can be frozen, pressure canned or dehydrated. Um, you can see kind of the information here. Um, when you freeze, you wanna make sure that you are blanching them um, and then doing an ice bath before you put them in the freezer. And that just helps to kill some of those enzymes that help that continue to ripen the plant. Pressure can, um, you want to make sure that you are using this in the correct order and that you're using fresh harvested produce. Uh, one thing to note with this is that it does have a really, really long processing time. So 70 minutes is what it needs to process for your hardier leafy greens. Um, and this is just because of how it's packed in the can. It really does take a long time kind of for all of that heat to penetrate the jars and get circulated. Um, and then for the dehydrating, um, this is a good option if you want to add it to soups, casseroles, sauces, and stews. Obviously, um, dehydrating it, it's going to make it into a more powdery form, but it does add those nutrients and kind of a richness to your soups and sauces. Next slide. And then what to do with what is being planted now. Um, so once you harvest these, um, when they're ready here in the next couple months, here's some ideas. Um, carrots actually make a really good vegan cheese sauce if you pur puree them with kind of cauliflower because they add that richness and almost that sweetness that carrots tend to have a little bit of a sweeter flavor. Um, carrot cake, muffins, pancakes, you know, adding shredded carrots adds those vitamins and minerals to even your sweet things like those. Um, beets, beets can be pickled. Um, an interesting thing about beets is that you can also eat the, the tops, the greens. And so a lot of people don't know that, um, but you can just kind of saute them up like you would any other green. Um, cabbage, homemade sauerkraut is, is really fairly easy to make. It just takes a little bit of time to ferment, but it is a great option. And then your leafy greens. Next slide. And so with that, um, that's just kind of a very brief overview of some of the nutrition about the crops that you're either going to be planting or harvesting and some ideas for how to use them. Uh, we do have a monthly nutrition that letter that we have kind of some of these same tips and tricks, um, but then we will also have like a recipe of the month. So if you need new recipe ideas, um, be sure you can follow us. You can either scan that QR code um, or you can also sign up through our website. And then if you ever have any general food or nutrition related questions, um, we don't have a direct, you can call me at our office or you can just email um, our food help email address and we will try to get those answered to you. But with that, um, I think that's all I have. And then we will go ahead and answer some of the questions. You want to mute real quick? <laughs> Trying to save us from another um, echo disaster. But um, yeah, so... Uh, before we get to the questions, I do want to correct myself on one thing. I said anthocyanins are the ones that keep uh, your brassicas from freezing during the winter, and those are the things that make them red, actually. <laughs> the word I was looking for was glucosinolates, um, which, um, yeah, I was proud of myself for remembering that word, and I remembered the wrong word, so <laughs> whoops. Okay, Chelsea, there's a few different questions here for you. Um Let's go to the first one here. It said, when you commented on eating eight cups of spinach to be equal on orange, uh, was it uncooked spinach leaves? Once cooked, eight cups probably equals one cup cooked. 
Yes, yes so Nancy, Nancy, you are correct. You are correct. It, it is. is. So once you cook those of uh, spinach leaves specifically, they are going to wilt down. So that would be eight cups of the raw uncooked. Um, so cooking it down, you are going to have some nutrient loss. Calcium is one of those that isn't necessarily lost. I don't know exactly the right equivalent of the, the cup um, in terms of once it's cooked. But yes, that was eight cups of the raw. Um, and then the next question about draining off the liquid after thawing the frozen tomatoes. Yes, you'll want to drain that liquid off because it is mostly just water. And so you wouldn't want that water to dilute your either salsa or tomato sauce taste specifically. Um, typically, if you have, if you're using fresh tomatoes when you're canning and you want a, a thicker sauce, you just tend to have to cook it a little bit longer to cook off that water and to have that nice concentrated rich flavor. Um, so that extra water after thawing is just pretty much water and uh, very little other tomato. And then um, strawberries and spinach to help unlock the calcium. Yes, so um, what binds up calcium is you have oxalates. Um, oxalates are very common in some of those leafy vegetables and also common, common found in beans specifically as well. Um, so they can help unlock, they, they bind up that calcium, making it unavailable. Um, having an acid, which strawberries have a little bit of that acid, having an acid with your um, fruit or sorry, your, a fruit with your um, leafy greens is going to help unlock some of that calcium. So adding an acid to the leafy greens is going to help unlock that calcium. So um, any adding any basically fruit or even like a little spritz of, of lemon juice on top will help to release some of that calcium to make it more available for, for use. Um, and then the last one, green carrot tops to make a pesto. I haven't heard of that, but I will definitely have to, to look into it. You know, the unique thing is that there are a lot of things that we throw away from the plants that actually can be consumed. Um, and so it's, it, they're, they're safe to eat. It's just kind of knowing how to use them and what to use them with. Those are great questions. Any other questions or comments? Awesome. Well, um, if you think of any, you can um, contact us. Uh, our information was shared there and you will be getting um, an email after with a short little follow-up survey. And then we will get you also the link for the recording. Um, so you can kind of go back and watch it at a later date if there was anything that you missed or wanted to, to re-listen to for more information. So with that, um, thank you all from myself and and for me. <laughs> We're in the same room here, but right you know, uh, the, the videos just work better, better when we each have our own video versus, versus trying to share a screen. screen. So, all right. Thank, thank you, everybody, again. And uh, we will catch you all at the, the next one. one. Tell them what, what the next one, one is. will be about. Yes. yes. It will be on the third Wednesday of September. I believe that is the 20th. Um, and it will be about cucumbers. So be sure to tune in. All right. Thank you, everyone.